short. Uh, can you all hear me? Wow. So we have a few folks that are still coming in, but we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, welcome to the Wright Museum. Uh, I'm Neil Barclay. I think most of I know most of you. <laughs> if I don't know you, please come up at some point during the evening and introduce yourselves. Um, I'm always anxious to meet all of our stakeholders, but particularly those who have been so supportive of the right as most of you have. I um, want to tell you a little bit about our guest. Uh, <laughs> look away. <laughs> So, um, restaurant and opera singer Alexander Smalls was born in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Graduated from Spartanburg High School and enrolled at the Wolford College before transferring to the University of North Carolina School of the Arts, where he received his BFA degree in opera in 1974. He then attended the Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, between 1974 and 77. Upon graduation, Smalls, a classically trained baritone, toured professionally as an opera singer, and as a member of the Houston Grand Opera, he performed in George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess, which would earn him a Grammy and Tony Award in 1977. Smalls studied opera and culinary arts in Europe. Upon returning to the United States in the late 1970s, he found his own catering business, Small Miracle. How do you have that? <laughs> hey, hey, I got, I got people. <laughs> CIA. In 1974, he launched his first restaurant, Cafe Beulah, in New York City, specializing in Southern Revival cooking that combined gula, gula and international cuisines. In 1996, he would open uh, Sweet Ophelia's, a casual dining venue featuring late night live entertainment in New York City's Soho uh, neighborhood. And he went on to open the Shoebox Cafe, an upscale Southern Bistro in New York City's Grand Central Terminal. However, that uh, restaurant was closed in the aftermath of 9 11. Snow founded a small catering business, Smalls and Company, where he served a celebrity clientele that included the, the likes of Denzel Washington, Spike Lee, and Toni Morrison. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Smalls. Um, I thought before I would get started, I'd talk a little bit about why I wanted to do this series for uh, the right. Um, as most of you know, we are an institution that's dedicated to African American history and culture. And what I wanted us to see are individuals uh, within our culture who are perhaps not to, to towing the usual path and who allow us to think about who we are as black people uh, in more expansive ways by looking at the multiplicity of roles that we play, not just in American society, but in the world and how those can intersect to inform who we are and who we continue to evolve to be as black people. So each of the speakers that we'll bring in, you'll see have this sort of multi-dimensionality to their lives and work. And so I wanted to begin uh, my conversation with Alexander. It actually began last night over several drinks. <laughs> I am a little hungover behind that, I must admit. However, we had a great time at the apparatus room. But I wanted to ask you, uh, what is your creative or, yeah, your creative origin story? Where does it begin? for you and, you know, sort of where has it taken you to this point? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I don't know that I've been asked that question uh, in that way, but <laughs> what I'm hearing is, uh, I'll respond to, you know, I, I grew up in Spanberg, South Carolina, uh, in a Gullah Geechee, low country household. That's important because um, essentially when you are from the low country, when you're from Charleston, Buford, and Gala Islands, 
it means a uh, very specific thing culturally. Um, it is so akin to the West African uh, cultural and culinary expression. And those become principles and, and um, guidelines for, for, for a living. So my grandfather moved the family from Charleston, uh, Johns Island, to Spartanburg when my father was a young kid. Um, and my mother, who was from upcountry in South Carolina, the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, the Piedmont, um, very different cultures that they had to marry together. But the, but the low country and its dominance and its cultures and particularly its food was defining. I mean, none of my friends were eating what we ate at my house. <laughs> it was just so different. I emphasize that only because I'm, I'm setting you up for the, the sort of ambiance of growing up in my household. It was a very loving family. Um, I had three sisters. Um, there was uh, lots of cousins, aunts and uncles. Um, and essentially, when you grow up in a one-horse town, um, in a community in the segregated South, which I uh, managed to straddle both integrated and not integrated in my upcoming, obviously in the 60s, in the late 50s and 60s, and early 70s. But the centerpiece of our lives was food. Everything evolved around the culinary expression. Um, and also you can imagine in the South, um, a lot of the uh, professional jobs and work for African Americans was in hospitality. You know, uh, you were a chef, or you may be a manager, but uh, in some way, or or you may be a cook or a um, you know a server. But hospitality was a big part of the cultural expression and the way people um, made a living. So uh, on my father's side, my aunt and uncle were chefs. Uh, both of them were in the Harlem era of, of, of uh, post-Renaissance, cooked in Harlem kitchens, etc. and of course would always come home. And then on my mother's side, her father and her uncle also were chefs. So that was a big, big part of my life. But this other part, was classical music. When I was born, my aunt and uncle, who were a part of the Hall of Renaissance, she was a classical pianist. He was a chef and played piano by ear. They had tried to have kids and had no success. Um, he found out many, 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 many years later when she got her social security, she was 12 years older than he thought. So that may have had something to do with it. <laughs> You know, these little secrets. <laughs> but nonetheless, when my father finally had a son, my uncle was so overcome with excitement, he and my aunt moved from Harlem back to South Carolina to oversee my education and be a part of whatever it was I was going to be. So as a young kid, I'm running around reciting Shakespeare in my mother's rose garden. I'm listening to opera. I'm studying classical piano, and I was an oddity for most people. It seemed normal to me because, it, again, it was my environment. The other part of me was cooking with my mother, cooking with my uncle. And so this shaped the foundation of being an artist. And, you know, I often say to people before I say that I'm all those other things that I am, I'm an artist because that was the foundation of how I saw the world and how I came up in the world being a creative force. So that's the foundation to the question. Um, I'm, I'm speechless. <laughs> that's the best answer I've heard of that in a long time. <laughs> that's really good, I love it. Um, so you've been a strong component of like lifting up the food cultures of the African diaspora as an important part of our history but also of our present moment. And so you sort of get at, get at that in your first answer, but when, when did you begin to realize how important the aspect, this aspect, meaning the culinary history, was to the African diasporic life and how important that aspect was to 
really get a complete understanding yeah. of who we are as black people, our identity? Well, I think, uh, I think I need to bridge the, that question uh, with some, some background. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as you said earlier, uh, my goal as a young uh, student of music was to become the first major African-American male opera singer on the global scene. I had idols like Leontine Price, Marion Anderson, um, uh, Shirley Verrett, uh, Martina Aurora, uh, a number of extraordinary women who had broken through the, the color barrier. And they were exotic. And therefore, women in opera uh, had an easier go at it. Most men were relegated to uh, German opera houses where they would sing three or four times a day and basically come back to the States with no voices. Uh, I was determined to break that cycle and after my success uh, in New York, um, uh, I took off and moved to Europe and, uh, and I was singing at the, at the Rome Opera House, Paris Opera House, uh, Florence, uh, Italy, uh, and I was making a name for myself. I'd signed with Cami Artists, and I had planned to come back into New York triumphantly and declare that I was going to be the face of that great black hope in opera. Um, uh, it didn't work out that way. <laughs> so uh, my good friend, uh, the opera singer Kathleen Battle, uh, had arranged uh, yet another audition for me at the Metropolitan Opera, and this was the third audition, and I'd flown in from Paris, I was very excited. Uh, in those days, you could smuggle a bottle of wine in your suitcase, and I did, because I knew I was gonna have something to celebrate. You know, everything was going as planned, I was almost on schedule, I felt, and I was going to have this audition at the Met, and it was gonna change everything. Well, actually, it did. Uh, but they did not hire me. What happened is after my audition, and normally you sing an aria, you start a second one, and then they tell you what they want to do with you. I sang two full arias, and I thought this was turning into a concert. And then I started the third one, they stopped me, and they said, oh my goodness, you've grown so much as an artist, you're this, you're that. And so what they did was, well, we'd love to work with you, and we'd like to offer you uh, small roles in chorus in our new production of Porky and Bess. Now keep in mind, I already had a Grammy and Tony for Porky and Bess in a principal role. <laughs> These people were offering me chorus and bit parts and uh, essentially a chance to be at the Met from somewhere. I have no idea, but I heard it. My mouth moved and said I would not be interested in that. The room just it was a pregnant pause. People, my agent was sitting there going, I don't believe you just said that. And I could tell she wanted to get up and say, oh, 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 oh. But she, she stayed. So I left the stage and I, she, I picked up my coat. I walked to the front door. She came running behind me. Do you understand what you're doing here? This is the map. Sometimes you have to come in the back door. Sometimes you have a, so I stopped her and I said, listen, it seems that I'm the only person in this room that understands I've just been insulted. It's not about the back door, the front door, I could fly in through the ceiling. It's about respect. I have put so much time, yeah, so much time and energy in a career that didn't even make room for me, and still I was there. So I went home. Remember the red bottle, red bottle of wine I told you about in my suitcase? <laughs> I spent the evening with that bottle of wine, and I lit the, the gas, the, uh, um, uh, those, those artificial logs you buy at the grocery store for fireplaces that don't work. I threw that in the fireplace. <laughs> I dragged my bottle of wine. I rolled around on my rug until the wee hours of the morning. But I woke up and I had a plan for Alexander Smalls. That plan was I was going to open the first fine dining African American restaurant, period. And what you have to understand, you say, how do you go from opera to uh, culinary arts? But 
Kalani was always my life. Throughout my life as an opera singer, I gave parties. I was a, the consummate New York host. Everybody came to my parties. Everybody. So I was doing all this stuff, you know, just simply because I'm an artist. And an artist creates within the frame and the lens that you have. And so what I learned from classical music, from opera, is that I not only had to have a seat at the table, I had to own the table. I couldn't own an opera house, but I could own a restaurant. I mean, maybe if I had worked long and long, I would have got there. If I had known this guy, we could have opened an opera house together. But I, I, I knew I could, do, I could do my own restaurant, and I knew what I needed to do. And I understood throughout my travels that African Americans were not, and Africans, I, I, I opened it up to Africans, we were not a part of the fine dining, elevated narrative and cuisine. Nobody made space for us there. And so I decided that was going to be my mission. And I was going to do everything I possibly could to bring us into that conversation on an elevated level. And so in the early 90s, I opened the first fine dining African American restaurant and I researched the location. It had to be somewhere they didn't expect us to be. I, I looked for the most expensive real estate I couldn't afford, but it was part of the concept that I had to deliver. So I took it to Park Avenue South, all right? And that was the new up and coming era where all the new restaurants were open. And I opened Cafe Beulah. I took soul food to fine dining. Because as I explain to people all the time, fine dining is a concept, it's not a cuisine. Before there was French fine dining, there was peasant food. <laughs> and most of us wouldn't have eaten it because they covered it with so much sauce because the vegetables and produce were so bad after the war. But the point is, is that why can't we pair our food with wine, with champagne, with rosé? And so I set out to do that. At that point, not only was I doing something new, but I was becoming an, a culinary activist. And it became important for people who looked like me to have the position, the power, the authority in that arena. Because there were other black chefs, and there were some that were far more talented than me. But the difference is I owned, and I could decide what I was doing, and they didn't. They worked for other people. Mm -hmm. And their expression, nobody wanted to see our food on a plate and call it elevated culinary dining. But because I owned it, I could do it. That's how I got started. And of course, the, the, the story of me raising the money to do all that, that's something, that's a whole nother mm -hmm. thing. But let me say this. As an opera singer and a New York host, I made a lot of good friends. And it was friends and family versus banks and loans that made that happen. The person who wrote the first check for my fine dining restaurant was Tony Morrison. The second was Felicia Rashad. And the third, if any of you know anything about Harlem, was the great Percy Sutton. Give them a hand. Give them a hand. <laughs> My goodness. It's incredible. Right. So, going back though, to this question of lifting this up as such a central part of all of our histories, I mean, you're certainly um, illustrative of that, what you've done with your life, but particularly here within an African American museum focused on history, how do you think culinary? can inform how we think about, how we tell our stories. Culinary is at the foundation of our culture. Essentially, the African people should own the culinary industry because we are the rock on which it's built upon. I wrote a book uh, that won the James Beard Award uh, a few years ago called Between Harlem and Heaven. This book is a study and an uh, exhibit of how through slavery, Africa changed the global culinary conversation on five continents. Africans, and we are all Africans, 
Don't let anybody fool you. I mean, you know, borders and categories and, and, and these kind of boundaries are, are sort of a European pandemic. You know, everything gets redefined. I mean, they even changed the name of Africa. The original name was Al-Kabulan. So, you know, we, we, we lose our collective because it is to somebody else's advantage that we do. But we always recognize each other when we put a plate of food on the, on the table, don't we? I mean, if you want to know who people are, just, just cook for them. But, you know, and we're all cooking the same thing. We, got, we all have the same grocery list. We may do it a little different <laughs> over here, over here, but we got the same grocery list. And that is the greatest gift that Africa has given to the world, to the global culinary expression. And so my career pivoted. I mean, you know, I set out to prove what I wanted to do, and that was to open the first fine dining. And then it was to put a face and a platform to African Americans and Africans working on a high level in culinary arts and raise us up beyond the pocket and box that we have been put into. Uh, essentially, it, and I became aware that we needed more representation, more support, and I needed to be an example and an influence and a mentor to bring other African, uh, let's say black and brown chefs to the table uh, and to create uh, an environment where we coexist. I feel strongly that through our food ways, we strengthen our bonds and our understanding of each other. When I first started going to Africa, for example, now keep in mind, I'm from South Carolina. You know, I'm that little boy that made it across the Mason-Dixon line and found refuge and strength and power all throughout Africa. I, I'm right now uh, writing a new cookbook with 27 African chefs about the food ways, the modern contemporary food ways of Africa. 2021, I opened the first African dining hall in the world in Dubai, 22,000 square feet, showcasing African food. Wow. I guess you could say I'm on a mission. Uh, <laughs> you think? <laughs> But I believe that, that who we are and what we've contributed to the conversation of the global expression is really rooted in our greatest asset and wealth, which is our culinary arts as black people. You know, you think of the great Leah Chase, you know, and, 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 and Verna Mae Grosner, so many women like that who basically laid the foundation before they knew who Martha Stewart was or some Alice Waters and all these people. There were these great women um, really laying the foundation of what culinary arts is in this country. So you, I want to shift a, a little bit. So you work with some of the, uh, work with, uh, had a world filled with some of the most interesting personalities living today. We talked about the, some of them last night that we mutually know. And, and so what have you learned from interacting with so many different kinds of people, so many different settings around the world? What would you say was your takeaway if you could sum it up from those experiences? The brilliance of our humanity. Mm -hmm. um, I have the greatest job, if you will, in the world. I get to feed people. I get to nourish and take care of them through the culinary expression. And sometimes I'm able to not only give them food, but give them history, give them culture, give them legacy. Um, before I became a restaurateur, I was a New York host. My parties were, um, it's, it's interesting too, because people, uh, the, I had the cover story in Food and Wine magazine in, 19, in 2020. And it was, it was all about the best parties in New York can be found at, 
Alexander Small's house. Um, but it's people. You know, I'm a people collector. I'm a people person. I love to bring very interesting, um, engaging people together over a meal, you know. Uh, and I've been able to do that with some of the best of ours, our jewels. You know, I used to cook for Maya Angelou, she would come. And there was some evening she'd get up and read a poem, uh, or, or recite a poem, uh, because she was a walking poem. You know, Toni Morrison would come up for my mother's bread and butter pickles, and she had an affinity for the seven-layer coconut cake. You know, I mean, this is when people are human. You put good food in front of them, and there, there's no difference. There's just humanity. So feeding people around the world, I was very fortunate uh, to be sent by Bloomberg Philanthropies to East Africa in, I think it was 2016, uh, to work with a, a woman's coffee plantation in Rwanda. And these women, um, they were so amazing. I mean, in spirit, you know, when you really want to see the wealth of us as black people, you know, you take away all the accoutrements, you know, you basically, and it's just spirit and, and, and heart. And they sang and danced for me and they served up their offerings. And, you know, it was, it's as if, you know, a hundred people pulled you in to embrace. But one of the things I did with them is I took them all to the open market in Rwanda, um, uh, food market because I wanted to challenge them about their diet. Now, what a lot of people don't know is uh, in many African countries and even during slavery, we were not we were not meat eaters. A, it wasn't given to us, and B, the only food we could eat was what we grew. I mean, and after, that was after we took care of the master's stuff. Then we had our own garden. If we didn't grow no food, we didn't eat. You know, the concept that, um, you know, uh, uh, we were, you know, eating all this meat and doing all that stuff, that didn't come until later. You know, the great Edna Lewis talks about in her cookbooks. Most of them are, 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 are for the most part, vegetarian. And livestock was, was served for special occasions, you know. And, and understanding that from an African-American perspective with our history, then going to Africa, for example, Rwanda, they, the, most of their diet is, 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 is pro, uh, produce. It's a, it's a vegetable diet. Um, but I took all these women to, to the to the market and we bought all these things and I went back and did a cooking demonstration for them. And because they don't eat a lot of meat, you know, the concern is their protein. So I taught them to make their beans with peanut butter. We grind the peanuts, fresh peanuts from the market and we made peanut butter and, they, and that peanut butter created a sauce for those beans that was really good over rice. Maybe. Ooh. Try it sometimes. Oh my God. <laughs> I want to try it right now. <laughs> but, but they also are coffee growers. So I taught them how to make um, red eye gravy, you know, this made from coffee. And, and, um, and we served that over, you know, there, every now and then they would have some chicken. And so I made a chicken dish for them with the coffee, the product. They had never imagined that they could do anything with coffee but drink it. Mm. You know, so, but, and I say all that to say that food is language. Food is a, a, a tool. Uh, and it's something that, that even if you don't speak someone's common tongue, you can have a, 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 an incredible conversation. And you know, your dinner parties are truly legendary in, in New York. I've added it to my bucket list, getting an invitation one day. Uh, but I, I'm just anxious. Uh, I mean, you sort of alluded to it, but how did that begin, really? You know, opening up your home to friends. You said it was part of your uh, artistic life, your creative creativity. But what, how did you wake up one day and say, you know what I'm going to start doing? I'm going to start having my friends over to my apartment. I'm going to cook for them. And, how did that start? Well, I think it started as a kid. Right. You know, I, I was the only kid uh, my parents had that liked to have 
people over. So my father built me a clubhouse in the backyard. And, um, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I would have a club. And the club uh, what existed only to have the barbecue, to have the party. So the, 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 we, everybody would come to the club, we'd pay our little dues, and ultimately it was going to culminate into a backyard cookout. I was the only kid in my family. My sisters had no interest in, in entertaining anybody. They couldn't wait to find ways to get out of the house. I brought everybody home. So it, it started there. What I understood as a kid is the person who wielded the wooden spoon in the kitchen had the power. <laughs> I understood that food had, was the person who made the food really was the person most loved, most revered, most favored, and I wanted to be that person, you know. And so um, I also needed my tribe. So, you know, when I was at the North Carolina School of the Arts studying, and also the Curtis Institute of Music studying, I would have these soirees where fellow musicians would come over on Sunday. I would cook all day Saturday, and then we'd have a whole day of eating and playing music. You know, and, and, and I had a big piano. At the Curtis Institute of Music, they give, if you're a piano major, they give you a, a baby grand piano Steinway to use while you were there. I was a voice major, but I had connections. So I had my <laughs> Steinway piano. And, and these, 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 these soirees were just life for me. And so it started back then, before I even knew I was going to be a restaurateur, and it's just continued. I mean, the night before I came here, I threw a party for the co-founder of BET, Sheila Johnson, whose new book, and everybody please go out and buy it, it's a great read, uh, pubbed uh, on the 19th at that day. So we were all carrying on that day, and every, that night everybody came to my house, 25 people, for an incredible spread. And we did all that, then I got on the plane the next morning and came here. <laughs> so, always a party. But it's a language. Yeah. It's therapy. There's no other way I know to best appreciate the people in your life than mm. feeding them. That's mm. what I do. Incredible. Tell us about uh, Small's house, is that <laughs> We got off on yesterday talking about this idea that you have, which I actually just love. Uh, but can you share with us that, that concept, that idea? Yeah, and well, Small's house was born um, out of a need and a desire to showcase young chef talent from around the African diaspora. Uh, I wanted to create special evenings uh, that I could share uh, the culinary voice of different African, African American uh, chefs who were telling their story on a plate. And so I started in my home the sit down dinners for 12. Um, and I sold those dinners to corporations and arts organizations as a, as a way of fundraising, as a way of um, educating or creating uh, a very specialized experience uh, for their company, which they couldn't otherwise find. Because, you know, we don't yet have a black James Beard house. Now, we are now part of James Beard House, uh, but it's not organic to what we do. And so out of that whole experience, uh, as I was saying to Neil last night, my next project is to feed the idea of a Smalls house uh, on a bigger scale. Obviously, out of my house where I can only serve 12 people in that way at a sit down, but into um, a bigger uh, uh, exhibition. I call it culinary exhibition space. I want to achieve two things. Um, you know, one is educate, create awareness for people to understand that we have this kind of talent in culinary expression, not only in our community, but I also want everybody else to know we have it. And I want to create, much like uh, a gallery 
or museum a way to showcase uh, chef talent. So one would be stationary. And then I have this concept of Small's House that travels. It could even come here, for example. For and we example. Set the table with, with incredible food and ritual um, and celebrate us through our culinary experience. The other part of it uh, is the academy, hospitality academy, training uh, our, our, our young folks in the hospitality industry to be able to go out and really get good paying jobs and work in that industry. Um, that too is very key. Uh, so, so that is the concept of Small's House uh, and I'm excited about it. I've gotten traction, I've gotten the attention of some grant people and some um, uh, art commissioners, et cetera. So we're gonna see where we can take it. The ride is available. <laughs> I'm just saying. I love it. <laughs> we can set up a tent here anytime. <laughs> I wanna open up uh, the floor to some questions now from all of you. Um, I'm, um, what's happening is they've written them down on cards. They're going to give them to me to read to you. Anybody have questions they'd like to ask? All right. Huh. So this question is, how can we depoliticize food globally? Uh, rich, good food, plenty. Poor gets bad food or no food. Hmm. I'm not sure I understand. Well, Great I think, I, for me. Yeah, I, I think what they're getting at is that they, we feel like you know, if you're rich, you have access to some of the best food, the best cuisine that might be available in that community. But if you're poor, you may not even have a grocery store that has the kind of fresh vegetables, spices, or whatever that you might want. So how can we? sort of depoliticize that, so that's not the experience right. of so many of us. Well, that's a twofold question. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about access. Um, there are a number of communities, especially uh, low-income communities, uh, it is by design that you don't have access. It is by design that you may or may not live in a food desert. Um, you know, you've heard of corporate America, uh, you know, uh, the rise of corporate America. And, and interestingly enough, I did this show called The Food of America, The Food That Made America. Um, I'm featured in that show a number of episodes. Um, but basically, um, not having access was the point, especially for low income, because what they did is they took away your vegetable stands your food markets and all those things and gave you, you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken and Pizza Hut and all these places, they made that more uh, available and cheaper. I mean, essentially going, I, I remember when I first moved to uh, New York, I was living, you know, uh, downtown with the rich white folk and, uh, uh, you know, everything was in a great abundance and, uh, but I was longing for a connection to, to an African-American community, so I used to spend a lot of time in going up to Harlem and, uh, you know, and I'd like to go up there and shop um, when I could or put my money in the community. You walked into the, the, the few drug, uh, grocery stores that were there and the vegetables looked like they were older than dirt. Literally, and not the dirt they came out of. Mm. They were sometimes gray. It was supposed to be green. Everything looked picked over. Uh, you know, sometimes I could smell the Clorox that, uh, from the chickens where they had bathed it. You know, again, it, and the food cost more, or just as much as my food downtown. The claim was doing business in high crime, low income area. The rents are higher. So they, and and besides. They're, most of them have food stamps or, or subsidies. And, and this, again, was a corporate effort to, so, so you, you have to accept that this was by design. You know, uh, one of the ways that 
a lot of urban communities balance that. Uh, and I don't know if this happened in Detroit, but in New York, in Harlem, you would see trucks that have driven all the way up from Georgia and South Carolina, full of produce. And they park on the street and sell groceries <coughs> out of the back of that truck, produce. And, and it wasn't that long ago, because I can remember living on Strivers Row in Harlem, 138th Street. The, the truck was on 7th Avenue. There were uh, many times where I would just go over there and buy a whole bunch of stuff because that's how they balance the food desert part. So that's one part of the, the question. You also have to remember that we live in a country that would rather throw perfectly fine, good vegetables in the garbage to keep the price from, from uh, up, from, from going down, rather than give it to you. You know, and the food they give oftentimes to food banks, uh, really, that's so restrictive. They pay farmers to, to burn their crops. I mean, this is the world we live in. So the cards are stacked against you if, you're, if you live in a low-income community, if you don't have. They make it twice as hard and twice as expensive to have these things. You know, what, what's the answer to this? Well, we got to get the right people in political uh, representation. Um, we have, you know, organizations, nonprofits that do what they can. But this is about how the government functions. You know, I, I, I'm not sure I'm totally answering the question for you, but it's 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 a big question, and it's it's a it's a it's systemic in our culture um, that that it's so difficult. Uh, for you to, to eat the food that's best for you. Because no one who's making the, the corporate decisions wants you to. They want you to go to the fried chicken place and they throw in a whole quart, whole gallon of, of, of Sprite for you. <laughs> you know, and go with the fried chicken. if you could read, you know, the ingredients and the inferiority of those products, what causes you to pause? Um, here's a question. Is there anything that you would like to speak to with regard to the future of food in the face of climate change? <sighs> in the face of climate change, we are all in trouble. And it's just not our food. It's our very lives. I mean, I don't know if you've been under a rock, but if you've seen the news, and the, and the catastrophes, the floods, the quakes, the fires, all of it. I mean, we are on the verge of a huge mess. You know, the food is almost the least of it because quite frankly, if we don't get this planet stabilized, it's not gonna produce anything, but hell. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. What is that Whoopi Goldberg said in that movie? You're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And do you think there's anything, though, now, too, because of, uh, you know, not having good, healthy food available and, and climate change? How, does that affect how you approach the food that you eat, that you make, that you think about making, you know, at your parties? Is that affected at all? Well... You know, my philosophy about food is if you can acquire good quality food, you're going to have good food to eat. Um, you know, short of your own cooking techniques, I'm not a <laughs> component of, you know, cooking my greens for two hours and all those kind of things. Because, you know, I want to get the most out of food. Um, it's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> you know, fresh food uh, only needs, you know, a high flame and a skillet or a nice big pot, and you just keep tossing it until, uh, speaking of vegetables, for example, I remember the first time I made, um, at my, my, my first restaurant, I, I did um, a collard green stir fry with... Um, uh, you know, garlic spice sweet potatoes. And I put them in this big wok as I had seen um, uh, cooks in Nigeria 
and, and gonna do, you know, and they had the real fire. You know, I at least have my, my burner, my gas burner, but they had real fire. And, and, and I've seen Asians do this in China. You know, you, that high heat hits those vegetables. You don't even have to add water because there's so much moisture already in vegetables. You just gotta keep it moving. And you come out, a little salt and pepper, uh, or spice that you like, it doesn't take much to eat well. It really doesn't. The psychological barrier is that we've given birth to generations of people who would rather walk up to the Kentucky Fried Chicken counter or the Pizza Hut counter. Nobody cooks at home anymore. You know, the ritual of dining together is, is suffering. Um, but it was our greatest resource. So my, I, I would encourage anybody to, to get in there and cook and cook with your family, and cook with the people you care about, and make that an evening. And, and uh, with respect to the quality, you know, obviously you have to, you have to work with what, you're get, what you can get your hands on. And, and you know, I, for, for what I do, uh, am fortunate that I have access to the best uh, available ingredients. I mean, that's just, because this is what I do and I know how to source and, and I, oh, I like to buy from farmers uh, and farm markets and things like that. I like to know where my food comes from. You know, today our food can, you know, you could be eating chicken from Taiwan, um, you know, and sitting in your grocery store, so you don't even, you don't even know. So being able to have personal relationships with people who, who uh, you buy your food from, if you're in that position and can do that, uh, it's a great resource, without question. Uh, this question is, what is your opinion of the fusion trends in diner? So long as it tastes good, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last night the waiter came over to the table and said, do you have any allergies? I said to bad food. Yeah, that's my allergy. <laughs> that's it. But no, I mean, listen, when I created my last restaurant in New York, The Cecil, The Cecil is the restaurant where I serve Afro-Asian American cooking based on the, the, uh, my studies about the footprint of African people on five continents. I created a, a kind of new culinary discipline and vocabulary to speak to the the collective of who we are as black people in a global world, a global society. Um, and, and, and so my greatest fear was that someone would think that was fusion because all you need is one fancy pants New York critic who would, who would dismiss it as some kind of fad moment. Um, uh, but my, my, my fears were arrested when the New York Observator critic wrote so brilliantly about the scholarship uh, involved in, in my train of thought and my culinary effort, how I had essentially used Africa's, um, well, it's in, and all this is through slavery, because that's how we got on five continents in the way in which, uh, so foundationally, and how I was telling the story of, 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 of our, the landscape of our lives. So it was very mean because I thought somebody would dismiss it because that's what happens. But with respect to fusion, I mean, if, if you're cooking something that is good, I really don't care. I don't care. I, I spent, you know, I almost opened an Italian restaurant the reason you say. I lived in Italy for three years as an opera singer, and I went for 20 summers uh, uh, to uh, 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 Italy every year. I can make some Italian food, and I love Italian food, but that wasn't my story to tell. Yeah. So we just have a few more minutes. I've got a lot of great questions. What do you think of the resurgence of the backyard or urban gardens, which is really 
really taken off Fantastic. here in Detroit. Yeah. I think it's wonderful. Do you grow your own produce at all? Or, do I? Or do you encourage the young chefs to, to start some gardening? Well, let me just answer for me. Yeah. I'm on the road about yeah. 225 <laughs> days of the year, if not 250. So I don't get to have that luxury. Um, but yeah, but some, some uh, young chefs, especially those who have restaurants, uh, and have that kind of resources. It's hard in New York, I don't need to tell you why, but you know, in, in other areas where there's more space, anything you can grow uh, yourself, um, it, just, it just translates into the dish so beautifully. So I'm all for that. Wow. So here's a, a, maybe a final question. So as a chef and a business owner, have you ever been stuck or at a point where you really couldn't create something that you felt um, was new, innovative, uh, stretching your own practice as a chef, um, and still being true, being able to be true to your own cultural roots and foods. And how do you do that? How do you evolve? How do you um, elevate, if you will? Innovate. Okay, so it's a two-part question. Yep. yep. The first the part of that question, question really. is no, I've never been stuck. Ah. No, no, okay. no, no. And, and, and I say that, you know, uh, with humility um, because, it, you know, it's a language and it's my language, uh, you know. Um, uh, no, what is it? Uh, cooking block, no writer's block, no cooking block. I'm always ready to go and be, uh, and because I take inspiration uh, and ideas from everything. I mean, it, 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 could, it could literally even come from, you know, something that is fast food related because it's ideas. And I, as the artist, get to uh, curate it in, in a, a way that speaks to my discipline, my truth, uh, and own it that way. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Smalls. <laughs>
Should we get rid of the mics? Uh-huh. I'm doing something for you. Give me one to hold. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Are we over here? I think so. You got it? You got it? Okay.